and greetings to Pastor Darren Roy and the brothers and sisters in Alverston. It's good to be back with you after sharing through the summer conference I'm with you. Uh, Darren asked me if I'd come back and share a message with you for this Sunday or whenever he chooses to, to play it back. But this is an exciting time. We're locked down with the COVID-19 and I know that's getting old for everybody because we've been around several months now and it just seems to keep going on and on and there in Europe as well as here in the States when you think it's slowing down it just kicks back up again so this has been very hard on a lot of people it's hard on everybody but some is really devastating because there's so much fear brought with it Uh, I'm not sure how it is in England and Europe but in the States uh, part of our conflict going on in our election is some people are trying to use this pandemic to score political points and by doing that they're preaching a lot of fear so they're always amplifying the negative things and suppressing any positive things so the result Uh, many people becoming more and more fearful but that's one of the signs of the time Uh, in the last days people's hearts will be failing them for fear of what's coming on the earth so this time last year when I was in Europe and I was in England it never entered our mind that this would be going on at this time for this long and it didn't just affect one country it's affecting nations all over the world so it's been a long time since we've had anything close to over 100 years where we've had anything closely comparable to this. <clears throat> so it's allowed things to manifest in us because it's brought pressure on us that in the normal life we wouldn't be facing. And that pressure exposes weaknesses in our foundations or what our foundation really is. Is it based on our strength and our lordship and what we can do or is it anchored in jesus as the cornerstone and he's the foundation so if it's on jesus we're on a solid rock and this pressure is not going to bother us his grace will be sufficient but if he isn't lord and it isn't based on him then these kind of storms starts undermining your foundation things you might have been able to handle when quote, things as normal and maybe occasionally something went wrong. Now that it's just consistently there, that pressure and the isolation that it brings with it from family and friends and even church family adds to that pressure. So it exposes those that really do not have a solid foundation in Christ, but it also confirms those who do. So those who have made the decision to trust God with all of their heart, then they're not anxious during this time. Philippians 4, 6 through 8 tells us not to be anxious about nothing, but bring it to the Lord. And he gives us his peace that passes all understanding. That's what those that are completely trusting in the Lord have now. Because this peace that passes all understanding it doesn't make any sense to have peace when you look at the outward. So if we look at what's going on around the world now, it doesn't make sense to have peace because things aren't peaceful. Yet when you do have peace and you're not anxious about anything, you stand out. And those you're in contact with on your jobs or in your families or your neighbors, then it stands out that you don't have the anxieties and the fears that they have. And that is a strong message because what you are speaks much louder than what you say. So before this, we could tell them about the peace of God and we tell them about there's nothing to be anxious about because God has things under control and we can trust Him. You can say that, but they don't really believe it because they don't really see proof of it so the good thing for the faithful christians is 
This is a time to prove your faith. That you are bearing fruit when most people panic and separate from the vine or don't trust the vine at all. So I want to encourage you to let God keep cultivating what's already growing in you. Yes, there's pruning times, but there's a time for budding out and the fruit coming out and become more abundant and more quality fruit. So a lot of things are going on during this time. As I get into the message today, I want to begin reading a scripture in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. <clears throat> and this is the Lord speaking about things that are going to be happening in the last days. When we're talking about the pandemic that's going on now, all the disturbance of being in the world, these are all signs of things that will be taking place in the last days. Before the pandemic even hit, we are already looking at all kinds of signs that tells us we're in the last day. So any serious Christian that really has any kind of relationship with God senses that time is short. Because of many other biblical prophecies and words that are spoken about those days. From the Old Testament to when Jesus was here until the last book of the Bible, Revelation, when he appeared to John when he was an old man on the Isle of Patmos and gave him the revelation and it speaks also about his coming in the last days. Even when Paul was preaching in 2 Timothy chapter 3 he was talking about this is what will be going on in the church in the last days. So I've talked a lot on that. So we see those signs appearing. <clears throat> so in the natural, in the political, in the church there's all kinds of signs appearing that says we're in the last days. <clears throat> now Jesus was sharing here in Luke chapter 21, and I'm going to read, start reading verse 25 through 33. <clears throat> and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts filling them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, he mentioned several things here, but again, he also mentioned a lot of things in Revelation and a lot of things through prophets of the old. And he said people's hearts will be fearing him for failing them for fear of what's coming on the earth. And that's a great destroyer. A lot of people are dying now just from this pandemic. The suicide rate has increased dramatically. So does heart attacks and that's just from stress-related deaths because of what's already happening on the earth. So all these signs that we already see, even though we're waiting on to see the Son of Man come in the clouds, that's what we're looking for. That, that's when everything is coming to an end. He's sharing all beginning, middle, and ending of these last days. But he said, when you see these things start, to come to pass when they're beginning not when it's at the end completely finished as soon as you start seeing these signs look up not be cast down look up because your redemption is drawing near we should be rejoicing Jesus came and paid the price for us to be his children, to be God's children, to cleanse us where we can be in God's presence, to be in his kingdom now, to be in Christ, where Acts 17, 28 says, that's where we live and move and have our being. But he described the kingdom in, in, in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So does that just count, that joy, 
when everything is going good. No. It's in Christ when you're in the Spirit, when you're in the kingdom, you should have joy. You should have peace. You know you're in right standing with God. And from that position, you're looking up. You're rejoicing because you know your redemption is drawing nigh. That's critical. So many people don't have that. They didn't have it when things were going fairly good. And you may deceive yourself in thinking, well, I'm okay, everything's fine, when everything basically is going good. But when things go wrong, that's when it tests whether you really have the peace of God or not. Or you have the peace of the world. That's when it manifests, are you really righteous? Because the only righteous there is, is in Christ. Or is it self-righteous because you're acting righteous and you're doing righteous things? <clears throat> Are you trying to be righteous like righteous under the law by doing good things? All of our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. So it doesn't have any power. But we need to be in right standing with God. And the only place to do that is in His presence, in His kingdom. <clears throat> and if you're there, to be in right standing with God to have that peace and have that joy in Christ, it doesn't require you to do anything. Because it's usually what we start doing that gets us out. The battle is to get in, because Satan tries everywhere in the world to keep you from humbling yourself and repenting and turning your heart to the Lord and choosing to trust Him. When you do that, you are in. That's the battle. And the scripture said, we strive, we struggle to enter into that rest. But, once you enter into the rest, you cease from your own labors. So yeah, we're laboring, we're battling with the flesh, and we're battling to get in, because we don't have full access of the Spirit flowing in us, because we're in the flesh. So it's a real battle for us to get to the point of willing to just give up and give it to God. But once we're in, we're supposed to be entering into the rest. And so if we're in the rest, and we see the times of these things are happening, then we should be looking up and expecting for the redemption to draw near. That's when the fullness of our salvation is completed, when He comes. We're His. He's coming for us. He's coming for those that are ready. He's coming for the bride that's made herself ready that's without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. He's coming for the wise virgins, not the foolish virgins. For those who are looking. So if you're going about it like many would say in that day, well, nothing changed, everything's going on like it was. So they just keep procrastinating, dealing with their relationship with the Lord. Even though they had it at one time, then they lose it, then they have it, then they lose it, then they have it, then they lose it. Where are you going to be when he shows up? When the bridegroom shows up for his bride, where will you be? If you're a child of God, are you going to be wise or are you going to be foolish? Because all ten of the virgins were looking for the Lord. And all ten of them at one time was ready for him to come. But five of them remained ready. Five did not, because he didn't come when they thought he should, or whatever reason, they just kind of drifted away and didn't keep meeting the conditions of staying in him, keeping their eyes on him, keep looking up. I'm going to go back to Psalms, the second chapter. <clears throat> If we ask, you know, basically, what is the number one reason why we're not really righteous, that we don't have the peace and we don't have the joy? Why aren't we there? What's stopping us? Well, we know we make the choice in our own place, but we're stopping us. you got a free will, and you have your spirit, and you can choose which nature you're going to yield yourself to obey. So ultimately, we make the choice. 
But if we're making foolish choices, then why are we doing that? Who's encouraging us to do that? Who is trying to convince us that there's no serious consequences for us constantly rejecting Jesus <clears throat> as the Lord of our life? <clears throat> why do we keep making excuses for why we don't deal with that? Why do we keep making excuses why our flesh isn't mortified? Somebody is giving us excuses, and that's Satan. And so he'll operate in many different ways. He comes as that angel of lie to try to give you some way that seems right, and you go, but you know it's not the right way. But he also will come with evil ways that just think to fulfill the lust of your flesh. But he uses another tactic. He brings fear. He brings a spirit of fear on you <clears throat> of what he says the Lord is doing or not doing in your life. And what he is saying to bring that fear are lies. He brings fear of what he can do to you. When God said, don't fear what man or anybody that help anybody can do you, the worst thing they can do is kill you. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. So the Lord is the only person we should have any fear of, not of the devil. <clears throat> God has not given us that spirit of fear. He gives us power, love, and a sound mind. <clears throat> so when I first began, I was completely ignorant of Satan's ways. It just seemed like so easy he could trip me up. I would humble myself and get in the spirit, but it seemed like no time I'm out again. So he had many different ways of doing that. But he also would attack me. And I didn't like the idea of him attacking me. You know, or threaten me in any way whatsoever. Yet, I would try to stand against him in the flesh, not knowing I was in the flesh. I'm trying to be spiritual, but it didn't seem to have much power against him. But once I realized that our power to resist the devil depends on where we're standing. If I am in Christ, he has no place in Christ, I can stand. If I'm in the spirit, if I'm in the kingdom, he's been kicked out of the kingdom. That's the only place in the universe he can't come. So he can't really come there. If you're still in areas that he's got access to your mind, he may try to put a pop a spam in your mind there and get you to open that and pull yourself out of the spirit. But it's up to you. Even Jesus, who was perfect, never made a mistake. Satan approached him and tempted him. But his response was, it is written. So I'm looking at how did Jesus and how would God deal with this situation of Satan. Because it's easy for us to say, well, I read the back of the book, we win. But if you also read the rest of the back of the book, there's a whole lot of people get overcome and fail, and a lot of people who overcome and win. So everybody doesn't win. There's a lot of losers at the end, and there's some winners. And so we're the one that's making the decision that's determined which one of those groups we're in. <clears throat> but I remember reading once the second Psalm. And at this point early, my encounter with God usually was through conviction. But when I finally quit resisting God and yielded to him, the conviction stopped at that point and just his love came. Then after that, yes, then the Father was purging me and cleansing me of all the things that would get me out of where I wanted to be in his presence. So that was all positive, working to my good. <clears throat> but I was thinking, how does the Lord approach this? This encouraged me because <clears throat> it never dawned on me at that time that God would have a sense of humor. That never entered my mind. Even though my father was a very godly minister, and he had a great sense of humor, uh, he shared with me when I was young, when I certainly didn't want to be a preacher, he said, if you're going to be a minister, it's good to have, it helps to have a good sense of humor. He said, it's not absolutely necessary, but it sure helps a lot. 
And he did that, and I didn't really understand that at that point. <clears throat> because my encounters while I was in rebellion then wasn't very ha-ha when I'm dealing with God. He wasn't anything funny about that at all. But then I was reading Psalms 2 one day, and I saw how he looked at the threats of Satan. Because Satan is always bringing condemnation. That's one of his tricks. God will bring conviction. That means he's convincing you that something's wrong. He's not showing you that because all of a sudden he found out there's something wrong with you. Now he's angry. And that's what many interpret the conviction is uh, as. But it's because he's now going to set you free from some snare the devil has you in. So he convinces you that what you've been doing was not the truth. So therefore you are in a snare and Satan's robbing something from you. And he's giving you the opportunity that if you will embrace that truth and renounce the lie you as a believer so your faith returns to you, then it opens the door and you're set free. So that's part of uh, working out your salvation daily. You should be getting saved out of some trap that Satan has you in. We're not talking about the final redemption. I'm talking about all the areas that Satan has access to you that he's robbing you from or hindering you like Paul said in the flesh, that which I would do, I don't do. And the first thing I don't want to do, I end up doing that. That's how Satan works in us in the flesh. But here in Psalms 2, <clears throat> I'm going to just read through this whole chapter. So listen very carefully to the words. It says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I sent my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. So here is Satan using the kings and the authorities and the councils of the earth that his plan is he's going to break the cord between the father and his anointed jesus now i don't know if you realize that satan absolutely the one person he hates more than anybody in the universe is jesus because jesus is the one who kicked him out of heaven he's the one's in charge of everything and he's the one that's going to bind him and throw him in the lake of fire. And at the end, when he comes for 2,000 years, his angels are going to bind him in the pit for that 1,000 years. So that's his arch enemy. So his thought was, if I can separate him from the Father and take him out, okay, then I, I can go. So Jesus shows up and lays down all his glory, his majesty, his power of who he is, the ruler of the universe. And he's born of a virgin in a humble place with flesh and blood like anybody else that can feel pain and it can die. So here was Satan's chance that he's going to break that between them. So he brought all the different leaders, you know, the Roman leaders and all the councils of the Sanhedrin all together to crucify Jesus. So if I can kill him while he's still in his physical form, then I broke that. And I'm, he's no longer in control of this earth. Because he knows that the Father put everything under him. 
He was there. He knows he created everything, including him. When he was Lucifer, he didn't, include, he didn't create him as Satan. He created him as one of the archangels. So he knows who Jesus is. Everything was created by Jesus and for Jesus. Everything you can see, everything visible, invisible, eternal, temporal, it's all his. So this scripture is saying that the Father is going to put to the Son everything, the whole creation and the people. And the heathen, the one that's against him, he will break with a rod of iron and crush. So he's warning them, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Now we know when he comes back, every knee is going to bow and every tongue on this planet is, is going to acknowledge he's Lord. Do you think everybody that's living at the point he comes back is going to do that? Because it says he's coming back to rule with a rod of iron, just like he's talking about here. So everybody that refuses to do that, his wrath is only kindled a little, but he wipes that out. He destroys that. And so he said, you understand who this Jesus is. So here Satan was thinking, all right, if I, I'm, my plan is to break them asunder. And God laughs at that. God thought it was funny. Now, it's one thing to have just say, <laughs> well, that's funny. That's silly. That's not what he's saying. He had him in derision. God is laughing at it. God's mocking him. When you look up what this means or read the Amplified, he says, God's not laughing at him. God's mocking at him just to think he can do that. And he let him believe that. He didn't overwhelm Lucifer or Satan at that time. <clears throat> And make it clear he can't do that. He let him go on thinking he's going to be able to do that. But he's laughing at him the whole time. So Satan is still right up to Jesus come here. He's still believing he's going to be able to accomplish what was already said that he was going to try to accomplish. Back here in the Old Testament in Psalms, eons before Jesus ever showed up. So when he showed up, he hadn't changed his mind. He's still going after to do the very thing he said he was going to do here in Psalms 2 when the God laughed about it. So now he goes and he brings all these people together. He not only brought the leadership together, but he had Gentiles standing against him, but also the Jews standing against him, the people of Israel. See, everybody, they had people from all groups coming against him. It was the crowds that were saying, give us Barnabas, crucify Jesus. So when he went through this and he came to die for us, when he put him on the cross, he thought then once he's dead, that's it. So he accomplished what he said he thought he, thought he accomplished, what he said he was going to do here in Psalms 2. So he finally, boom, he's dead. That broke it. That's finished that. So... He's down in hell, and they're celebrating the victory. The only problem is, Jesus didn't stay in that grave. And he didn't sleep for three days either. Before he ascended, he first descended into the innermost parts. Now, I won't get off on all that, but the bottom line is, he did. I don't have time to get in a full teaching on that. But he made a show of Satan openly there, putting him under his feet, taking the keys to death, hell, and the grave away from him. He went over into paradise where all the others that had been looking for the Messiah, preached the gospel to them, led captivity captive back to his father, went into the temple of the mercy seat, put his blood on the mercy seat, came back, and rose. So he wasn't just napping for three days. He was busy. So I just kind of imagine when they're partying in hell because all these thousands of years Satan is waiting to get this done, he finally got accomplished what he thought he was going to accomplish. 
celebrations going on, and Jesus shows up. I don't know if you noticed in the scripture, it didn't say he showed up with 10,000 angels. He showed up. He didn't need backup of the angels. He showed up. Can you imagine the look on Satan's face when he shows up there? Now, I'd like to know what was on Jesus' face when he showed up there. I mean, did he show up angry? Or did he show up laughing? Because that's what the father was laughing about. The fact he thought he could even do that. So just the fact that he tried to do it, and now all of a sudden, <clears throat> this is what the father was laughing about. He was mocking at him derision because there's no way in the world this is going to work. So anyway, that's pretty embarrassing. So always think about that so that anytime Satan comes at me and tries to threaten me or try to tell me what all he's going to do to me, I first of all, I want to make sure I'm in Christ. Because if I'm in Christ, he has no place in me. Okay. So if he's dealing with me, he has to deal with Christ first to get to me. So that's an important point. You can't be outside of Christ and be Lord of your own life and think you can stand there and resist the devil. But he's not going to go anywhere. He's just going to keep attacking you. So that attitude of <clears throat> when he threatened, God laughed. I think it's in 1 Peter. I'm not sure it's 1 Peter, 1 John. I think it's 1 Peter. Where it said, Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And when I went to Africa, I found out the roaring lion was was the old line that is old and arthritic and his teeth falling out. He couldn't chase the gazelles anymore. But they didn't have a welfare system. Everybody had to do something you didn't eat. So that's biblical in that. And it doesn't work, they don't eat. So the females are normally the one that killed, but there could be some gazelles there and the female would go lay in the in the grass, the high grass, and they send the old lion, male lion, and he'd hobble around to the opposite side. And when he's directly aside, across from the female lions, he raised up and roared real loud, scared the antelopes or whatever they were, and they turned and go the opposite direction right into the hands of the female and then make a kill. Then he'd come over and he, he earned his dinner. He got that. So I saw the devil as a roaring lion, but it said he went about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I'm sharing this in Overston, England. That's from the King James Version. Y'all had the devil being very polite. God see the devil come and say, May I devour you? And that seemed kind of funny to me. And I thought, You may not. Because <laughs> as your faith is, so be it unto you. But what if he says, May I devour you? And you say, No, nah, I don't think you can devour me. Maybe you could eat my hand off and not my whole body. As your faith is, so be it unto you. So you just gave him the authority to eat your hand off. As your faith is, so be it unto you. So I don't believe he can do any. So when he roars, I get a picture of that lion, and the first thing I do is laugh. Because if those gazelles knew that roaring lion was arthritic, his teeth had been pulled, fallen out, he really wanted a real danger to him. Which direction should they have went? They should have charged right at him and just run right by him. He couldn't have done anything about it. So my attitude was charge the roar, challenge the one that's doing the roaring. And I'll give you a quick example of that because Satan hasn't done that to me in, in so many decades. But the first time in the late 80s I went to Africa, I'm going into a country just been taken over by a military coup. All police is abandoned in the country. Every warning in the world is that you don't go there in any conditions. And I went there for 30 days and ministered pictures six times all over the country, including the Muslim North. But before I left, I didn't have any communications. I didn't, didn't have any, how, what things were like there. I didn't know it took three months to get a letter there and back, so I'm waiting on, on a letter but I'd already made plans to go. <clears throat> the Lord said I was to go. 
And the last time Satan ever openly threatened me was before I went on that trip. Because all of a sudden, boom, here he speaks in my mind. He says, when you get to Nigeria, I'm going to kill you. And the first thing I did was laugh. And I said, well, if you're going to kill me, why do you need to wait till I get to Nigeria? You need some help or something? If you think you can kill me, jump on it right now. But I hurt his feelings and he went off. Because I was in the Lord. But if the spirit of fear came on me and I moved into the flesh, then I wouldn't have went. I've been afraid to go because I'm going to get killed if I go over there. Because everybody else already told me, you're going to get killed if you go over there. When I got over there, they said, leave, you won't get killed if you stay here. But all I had going on was the Lord was with me. So I made sure I stayed in the spirit. And so I had that peace. I was in right standing with God, and I had joy. Okay. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, it says, 831, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, everybody's quoted that scripture so many times. But before that, it was talking about fulfilling God's purpose for us. Because those whom God predestinated, he called. And those he called, he sanctified. So it gives the different stages of growth from the time God chose you to you reach where you're supposed to be in his kingdom. That journey... Is what he's saying. If he's for you, who can be against you? There's not anybody on this planet or in hell can stop you, God, from getting you to where he's ordained you to be. If he's for you, nobody can stop you from doing that. And yet we let the devil and everybody else stop us from doing what God's called us to be. The grace of God is sufficient. If God's called you to do something and there's a journey you're supposed to take, you have the Holy Spirit in you and the Lord to direct your every step from the beginning to the very end. And God's grace is sufficient for every step because God is for you and there's not anything in the universe can stop that process from happening except you. If you don't believe that and you're not willing to trust him, you stop it. As long as you're trusting God, nothing in the universe can stop it. The only person can stop it is you because God gave you a free will and he's not going to force you to be blessed. For you to rule and reign in his kingdom, he gives us an opportunity. He has prepared a place for us He's chosen already, prepared for us in eternity how we're supposed to rule and reign. And he starts at the beginning with the seed, and he gives the power to bring it all the way through to fruition till it's bearing the fruit, and we fully receive all the inheritance that he's provided for us. You can't read the Bible without realizing many of these wonderful promises have conditions. But the guarantee of God is, he will meet, he will see that you meet every condition until you reach the goal he set before you. Again, the only person who can stop you is you. So many quote that scripture when they're failing, but they're trying to believe that they're going to win anyway when they've made the choice to fail. They will not yield his lordship. They sin, they get out of his presence, yet then they try to claim this scripture that if God's for me, who can be against me? But the question is, is he for you? God gives grace to the humble. That's for you. 
But God resists the proud. That's against you. So God is either for you or against you. If he's for you, nobody can stop what he's ordained to be done. But if he's against you, then the other side of that coin is, if God is against you, no one can help you. No one in the universe can help you get to that goal you want if God is against you. Even if it's clearly and you have 400 confirmation, this is what God wants you to be. If you try to get there as Lord of your own life, which is pride, God is going to resist you and there is not enough people on this planet to believe with you and to pray with you to get you there. Because if he's against you, nobody on this planet or in heaven is going to be for you or can get that done. So we quote one side, but we also need to understand the other side. So why do we get so weary in serving God? Why is it so hard? Because you're trying to get there a way that's not lawful. You're trying to be Lord of your own life. You still wrestle with that lordship issue. And when you do, God is resisting. Not because he hates you, because he loves you. Because the more time you spend going that wrong direction, the less time you have getting to the fullness of what he wants for you. Satan is a thief. And the most valuable thing he robs from us is time. If he can just run the time out, then there's certain things you just don't have time to qualify for. So if there's a thousand things that God wants you to have that needed to meet a condition, and you needed 40 years to meet those, and you don't give him lordship for one year left, you're not going to get 40 years of stuff done in the one year. He will pick the most important things, yes, and get those done. But so much of what should have been done, he's already stolen from you. So it's important that we deal with that, at least when we show up at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want to be having to answer for things that I never even repented of. I may have lost what was in the future, but the penalty for what I did in that, beyond that, at least that gets taken off my record that is not held against me. And that's the opportunity we have at this, this point. In 1 Peter, uh, chapter 4, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Obey not means to disbelieve willfully or perversely, not believe, disobedient, obey not, or unbelieving. So it clearly said there's a time when judgment is going to first begin at the house of God. And at the righteous He said, what shall be the end of it that, that be not? And he goes on to say, if the righteous barely be saved, where does that leave the rest? It's not good. It means it's a tight standard. There's a narrow way. There's a narrow path. And that's through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get to the Father except through Jesus. If you don't go through Jesus, then the sin isn't cleansed. If you're not in Christ, it's not cleansed. Your robes are spotted. You don't meet the condition to go to the Father and be in His presence. So it's very important. You might ask, why is the judgment going to begin in the house of God? Because that seems kind of harsh. You know, there is a judgment. The question is, when you stand before God after it's all over, we're dead, or either Jesus has come back, then there's no changing. Whatever's been written in the book, whatever you've done or didn't do, what you repent of or didn't repent of, it's there. And in that judgment, everything's going to be brought up. Not one thing's going to be hidden. Not even a secret thought of anything is going to be hidden. So it's going to be clearly proven why you're wrong or why you missed something and why you're receiving this penalty. It'll be clearly shown and proven why you're being blessed and why you're receiving this reward. It'll be clear. So Lord, I said, well, why did he get that? And I didn't get it. Here's why he got it and here's why you didn't get it. It'll be clear. 
So at that point, you're like, oh man, I wish I'd have done that. I, I thought about doing that, but I never did it. I just wasn't convinced that it was necessary. Lord, I'm repent. I'm sorry, I will repent. Too late. You'll find no place of repentance at that. That's it. It's over. So, if God is love, why would he just let us go along ignorantly and pile up all these problems that's going to come against us in judgment without us getting blindsided and knowing it's even coming? He gave us the word of God so we can know what the conditions are. He's given us preachers to preach. He's given us the Holy Spirit in it to reveal these things there. If God convicts you, and most people don't see the blessing of conviction, but when God gives you ears to hear the truth, He's blessing you every time He does that. Because He's showing you something that's going to cost you a judgment, not only the loss of penalty for what for doing the wrong thing, but if you repent of it, you also then he's going to show you what is the right thing that will produce a reward instead of a loss. And it gives you a chance to get that off the slate so that you're not brought up in the trial of what you have to go through that. So now there's grace. Now we can find a place of repentance. But then it's too late. So anytime God convicts you, you ought to be thanking him for doing that. If you don't like conviction because you think it makes you feel so uncomfortable, there isn't but one reason it's uncomfortable because you don't like it and you're resisting it. And you don't understand the blessing that it is. If you knew what a blessing it is, you'd be jumping up down praising God that it came, that it gave you a chance to rescue yourself out of something that Satan was stealing from you and to claim your inheritance that God has for you. Why wouldn't you celebrate about that? Because the blessing is going to last for eternity. But so is the loss. You don't lose something for half the eternity then get it back. You've lost it. And so we need to change our attitude about the conviction and God working our lives and the last days. He's given people ears to hear things they never heard before. Our ministry travels around the world and we're bringing revelation and truth that many people in churches have never heard. They've never seen the blessings of God or uh, you know, how much love He has for them and the fact that they could actually know Him and the message that we bring through the My Sheep and My Voice or now the last days, the Wake Up series. All this is there so you can rescue yourself as quickly as possible. You don't have time to go dig out everything I dug out and processed in my life. I can show you what it is. So you just start the revelation and the Holy Spirit quicks that to you or convicts you. That means he's authorized you to process it and get it out. So it's very important that we understand the blessing of that and that we immerse ourselves into the Word of God, into what God is saying to our hearts, and we spend quality time before him so we can produce and process as many of these things as possible. That's why I'm excited with some of you that have been using this pandemic, the fact that you are stuck at home or maybe you can't even go to work and you've got quality time and nothing to do. This is the time to be, this should absolutely be the most prosperous time of your life spiritually. It gives you a chance to really get rid of all those excesses that Satan has, to get that things off the book to get the work done for the right reason in the Spirit so it produces a reward, and that you're excited and you're looking up and you're ready that you know, your lamps are trimmed. You, you got the oil in your lamp. You're ready and looking for the bridegroom. Romans chapter 11. Verse 22. It says, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Now I'm running kind of short on this 
time this morning, so I want to try to get this in as much as I can without it having to be a, a two-parter. So I'm going to have to just quote some of these things without taking time to read all of it. We know that in John 15, verses 1 through 13, he talks about Jesus the vine, the Father is the vine dresser, and we're supposed to abide in the vine. And it makes it very clear. And unless you abide in the vine, you cannot bear fruit. Now, yes, you can bear fruit without being in the vine, but not good fruit. You'll bear bad fruit that has no value whatsoever. But I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The peace and the joy, all these things is there. That can only happen by not visiting the vine, but abiding in the vine. If you do that, then the Father, he says, every son he receives, he's going to thoroughly purge. That's pruning. So you get in Christ, and the Father is going to start pruning and getting all the bad stuff away that's going to hinder that branch from flourishing. And his motive is, that in the Amplified, that you bring forth more quantity and quality of fruit. And it culminates, and the reason for that is, in verse 8 then, herein is your Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Our Father is glorified when we honor His Son. That's what the Scripture said. Our Father is glorified when we honor His Son. Then you honor His Son by abiding Him, which means you're trusting Him with all your heart, and you're going to do what He tells you to do. That's how you abide in Christ, and that's how you glorify God. And how God treats us at the end is based on how we treated His Son. I don't have time to get into all that teaching, but if you don't believe that, you need to do a, a search on that. Because when we show up at the end with the Father there, and he, He's making some of these final choices there for eternity, where we are in place of honor we're going to be is going to be measurable by how we honored His Son. But we're vessels of honor, or we're vessels of dishonor. And we each one of them categories, there are different levels of that. So this old fake belief of Satan, the lies of Satan, that everything's the same when we get there, it doesn't matter what you did, everybody gets the same thing. It's an absolute lie of Satan. It's contrary to scriptures anywhere you want to look. But this scripture says, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. I could do a whole series just on this one thing. But those of you that's listening to me in Overton and the others that's friends of SOLM that be listening to this tape, you heard this before. I'm just reminding you again of it. That there are consequences. You can't just see the goodness of God and say there's no severity of God. Because that's a false Christ. Most churches around, many churches around the world, they're preaching a false Christ. All they share about is the goodness of Christ they never share anything about the severity. And therefore, people add and fill in the gaps and come up with a conclusion of who Jesus is that doesn't have any severity in it. Well, that's not the real Jesus. That is a false Christ. So if you're not preaching that balance, then you're proclaiming a false Christ. We need to understand that. There's consequences. He says before us in Deuteronomy 28, before Israel, I sent before you blessings and cursings. You know, he gave one condition. If you hear my voice and do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to be blessed. If you're doing the other, you're going to be cursed. But who's making that decision? Jesus is. One of them is goodness and one of them is severity. And it's all dependent on one simple thing, that you take the initiative to acknowledge God in all your, and do what he's saying to do this day. That's lordship. That's why Satan fought, fought so hard against that. Because with one thing, he takes everything out. He takes all your blessings away from you and puts all the curses on you by getting you to just disobey one simple command. The reason many don't do it is because they're not convinced that there's any real consequence of them continuing to be Lord of their lives and committing spiritual adultery against the Lord. They don't seem to think there's any consequences. Even though all that is recorded and it has to be answered to. It is serious consequences. And one of the things that's missing, very seldom do you hear anybody preaching about the severity that brings the fear of the Lord. Even though Proverbs and Psalm talks about 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but it's also the beginning of wisdom. You haven't even started to get smart spiritually if you don't have that fear and reverence of God. I know who he is, and I want him on my side, not against me. But you're making the choice. I'm making the choice. In now and in the very end, is he going to be for me or against me? If he's for me, nobody can stop what he wants to do for me. But if he's against me, nobody can stop what he's going to do then either. There's consequences to our decisions. One last scripture, and I'm going to quit with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> verses uh, 17 through 21. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching. I see preachers sometimes get so puffed up and exalted because they're up there preaching and they're really firing, going for like things really going good. And it's like they're super smart or something. When everybody in the world is sitting there looking at you like you're foolish. Because it seems foolish. First Corinthians 2 is talking about the difference between the natural realm and the spiritual realm. And to the natural, the things of the spirit seem foolish. Because they can't understand it. So when you're preaching truth that has cannot be received by understanding and reasoning, it has to be received by faith. And you can't put your hands on it and, and prove it scientifically, it seems foolish. So all the ways they have of proving whether something's truth or not, God made it of no effect. He's made them look foolish. Because no matter how much they do, they cannot understand anything of the kingdom of God. God set it up that way. The only way they're going to get to his, if he's going to use the foolishness of preachers, of what's being preached, is the only way they're going to get there. Then he picks people to do that foolish preaching in their minds. And he doesn't choose many wise. But he also chooses the foolish of this world. That they would say is foolish. They would say is not qualified. He used them to confound the wise. Not the one that said, well, yeah, he's got a PhD from two or three different seminaries, different places. I can see maybe I'll listen to him see what he's got to say. Now he'll pick somebody that'd be the last person on the planet they would pick. Just like the disciples. The people perceived that they were unlearned. They weren't polished. They weren't highly educated. And so to those educated, it seemed like foolishness to them. But to those that are of God, it's life. It's the world. It's what brings us into the kingdom. So I want to close now. And I don't mean it's going to be another 30 minutes. I'm going to get it close. <laughs> but for those of you that have heard this message for years, I want to encourage you because I'm hearing good reports out of Alverstone from Darren that you're making a lot of progress. I'm hearing from Keith and he's working with people all around the world. And a lot of progress is being made during this time. primary message that Keith is preaching around the world is on repentance. We've got to get settled who is going to be Lord of our life. The repentance is the key to life. That's what gets you out of the snares and gets you into life. So we need to be embracing that as such a blessing, not a penalty. That doesn't go on forever. Sooner or later, the devil has no place in you. 
and you get on just enjoying living in the kingdom. But you can't enjoy living in the kingdom if you keep leaving the viruses in your computer where Satan can get to and destroy and keep pulling you out. And those of you that are still wrestling with that decision, just understand, time's running out. And one of the tricks of Satan is saying, well, I've heard all this before. And he hadn't come. He's coming. But it doesn't matter if he doesn't come for another hundred years. You're going. You're leaving. One way or another, your time is going to run out. And you can't buy anymore. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, you can't buy more time. When God says it's time, the clock stops, and that's it. And then all you got to look for is the judgment. So now is the day. Now is the day of salvation. And everything, the root of all your problems, if you're struggling and not growing consistently in the Spirit, there isn't but one major root problem. Jesus is not the consistent Lord of your life. It's just as simple as that. So don't waste years trying to think if I fix 900 other things that's going to solve it. It won't. You will still have that same problem. So enjoy being with you. and God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And I'm excited to be able to share it with you. Can't be there in person right now. I look forward to that because I miss everybody. I have so many friends in different parts of the world. But it's nice that at least I can stay here in my home and still share with you. So God bless you.